So hi everyone, my name is Srishti and I'm an undergraduate student from Punjab, India. This summer I did a research project under the guidance of Dr. Tony, which title was Quercivate Models as Protocells to Study the Origins of Life. I chose this project because it explores the origins of life, including what the first cell might have looked like and how it might have been formed. It will be simpler to look for life elsewhere in the universe if we, if we discover the answers to these questions. So to start with, I would like to start with the basics, the cell. So cell is the basic building block of life, which consists of cytoplasm, nucleus, cell membrane, and a lot of cell organelles, both membrane bound and membraneless. This is basically the diagram of a modern cell, which shows most of the cellular components. But the question arises, how did the first cell evolve from the mixture of molecules under the prebiotic conditions? To answer that, let's look on to the stages of origins of life on Earth. So starting from the habitable Earth to the abiotic synthesis of the simple molecules to protocells, the primitive cells, and from there to the last universal constant, sorry, last universal common ancestor which is the population of the organisms with which all the organisms now living on Earth share common descent. But these were not the first life on Earth. And then finally leading towards the vast diversity of life on Earth today. So let's discuss in detail about the protocells. Protocells or simply the primitive cells are the simplest compartments that mimics the characteristics of the living cells. The living modern cells might have evolved from these protocells, which could have been membraneless compartments. They are different type of protocells models which mimics the reactions and molecules we see today. For example, lipid and polymer vesicle, water in oil emulsions, colloidosomes, proteinosomes, and quercivates, etc. But these membraneless protocells were able to coordinate all the complex chemical reactions within it. But how? By constructing compartments, which are the district, uh, distinct chemical environments under which all the components are able to diffuse freely by the process known as compartmentalization. Compartmentalization defines the boundaries of the biological system by separating its internal volume from the external environment, which is essential for the cellular activity. So basically there are two types of compartments the one which are separated by membranes or the membrane bound compartments such as mitochondria which generates atp by utilizing the energy released during the oxidation of food we eat or lysosomes which functions as the digestive systems of the cell the other type is membraneless compartments for example stress granules which can take on different forms depending on the types of the stress conditions and nucleoli which produces ribosomes inside the nucleus. So many non-membrane bound compartments likely have the properties of the liquid droplets, like they're able to fuse, they exchange components rapidly with the cytoplasm, and they're easily deformed by the flows and have viscosity similar to honey. The best way to think about them is as liquid drops that coexist with the cytoplasm. But again, the question arises, why don't the components in these non-membrane bound compartments just naturally blend with each other during their, in their surroundings? So the answer to this question is because of a physical mechanism known as liquid-liquid phase separation. So uh, one of the ways in which cells could have emerged from prebiotic chemistry to the primitive earth to protocell and to the mo modern cells is by dividing their internal space into some segregative compartments by using liquid-liquid phase separation or LLPS. So there are a few properties of LLPS, which includes like they're able to create dynamic intracellular compartments by doing partition of the internal volume of cells into compartmentalized membraneless organelles, such as stress granules, pea granules, or germ granules. Secondly, they enables the cells to regulate the biochemical reactions by concentrating specific proteins or nucleic acids, then LLPS also has a potential foundation for emergence of complex cellular functions, 
such as specific double stranded DNA binding. Other than that, LLPs leads to compartmentalization, which defines the boundaries of the biological system by separating its internal volume from the surrounding environment. Quercivate is an example of such membraneless compartments, which are formed spontaneously through LLPs. These are enriched in one or more solute species, such as polymers, proteins, or nucleic acids, and they can be easily absorb and concentrate substances from their surroundings. To create quercivates in vitro, a wide variety of molecules can be used, such as synthetic polyelectrolytes, polysaccharides, peptides, proteins, or polynucleotides. So the LLPs systems are of various types. The first includes segregative LLPs. They're like two more soluble molecules, which can be polymer, nucleotide, or amino acids, which do not mix together despite of all the favorable mixing entropy due to repulsions between them. Second comes the associative LLPs, better known as complex coercivation. It is driven by charge-charge interactions. In this, two soluble molecules end up together in the same phase due to attractive interactions. And then there's simple coercivation. So this is driven by hydrophobic attractive interactions, such as pi pi, cation pi, hydrogen bonding, and dipole-dipole interactions, which are present in single molecule. So at a specific solution temperature or pH and salt concentration, this kind of molecules become insoluble because of these all interactions between them. As mentioned before, Quercivate formation can be of different types. And I'm discussing about the peptide-based quercivate models because for the formation of life like quercivate protocells, peptide seems to be more promising molecules because of their selectivity in guest molecule uptake and physiochemical and catalytic properties of the compartments, which are also made possible by the functional diversity of the amino acid residues available in the peptides. Then the canonical or the proteinogenic amino acids are the amino acids that are incorporated biosynthetically into the proteins during translation. There are about 20 canonical amino acids such as alanine, glycine, etc. And then the non-canonical amino acids, these are the non-proteinogenic amino acids that are either found naturally in the organism or are synthetically made in the laboratory. Example could be ornithine, a basic non-proteinogenic amino acid, which was present in the early proteins, but is absent in the modern proteins. There's also possibility of the early peptide-based coercivates being composed of these non-canonical amino acids, which are formed by spontaneous abiotic synthesis. The length of the peptides also plays an important role in phase separation, but small peptides with as few as two adjacent aromatic amino acid residues have been observed to phase separate. It has been found that uh, the shorter peptides shows better potential as prebiotically feasible building blocks for protocell formation. Then there are different types of peptide-based coercivate systems. Most commonly, the complex coercivates and the simple coercivates. Under complex, the first is peptide nucleotide coercivates. So it has been suggested that polypeptides and nucleotides could be the basic components of these model membraneless organelles as protocells. And an example could be poly L lysine, at, along with the ATP and other mononucleotides, which forms coercivate micro droplets. Then is the peptide peptide coercivates, which are formed with two different oppositely charged peptide components. An example could be polylysine and polyglutamate. So here the charge charge interactions drive the formation because lysine is positively charged and glutamate is negatively charged. Then the peptide inorganic coercivates. So as the metal ions interact with variety of peptide donor groups, including the N-terminal amino groups and C-terminal carboxyl groups, functional nitrogen sulfur containing groups, the simple peptides and the metal ions interact, interactions has been explored as a pathway to phase segregate. 
Then comes the simple quasi weight simple uh, systems. So this also have different types of model system and they require single type of peptide, which is responsible for whole phase separation. But much less is known about this whole simple quasi-weight system in comparison to the complex quasi-weight systems. Talking about the future aspects, so the quasi-weights could advance from the passive compartments to protocells displaying lifelike behaviors by transforming their chemical energy into the kinetic energy, which could help to generate abilities similar to the living cells which grow, which move, which can maintain homeostasis, and that could result in further formation of active droplets in which chemical processes could act as the prebiotic metabolism. Then the artificial cell research could further help in explaining the origins of life better because it has roots in both primitive compartments or protocells and synthetic biology. To conclude, I would like to say that ideal building blocks for creating the protocells could be peptides and dividing active quasi-weight droplets, as we discussed, which could help us to study and explore more about the origins of life. And shorter peptide shows better potential as prebiotically feasible building blocks for protocell resembling living cells. At last, I would like to acknowledge my YSP mentor, Dr. Jia, who has guided us in this project and supported us throughout. It was an honor working with him and also my fellow YSPs, Arunava, Ritwik, Prachiti, and Tan for the wonderful collaboration and teamwork. I would also like to thank BMSIS for giving me this opportunity to work with all these incredible bunch of people. Thank you. Fantastic job, Shristi. That was wonderful. Um, I, I will say I've known Tony for a long time, um, and I feel like I feel like today the presentation from yourself and your and your peers and in, in the YSP is teaching me so much more about coacervates and and this level of research <laughs> than I ever had before. And one thing that your talk really just like kind of inspired me thinking about is the possibility for protocells um, in in these peptide coacervates. And it makes me it makes me wonder though is there a, is there a model or a pathway to then build um, build a membrane around the, the structure inside um, is there a way to then get from that proto cell to an actual cell that you can envision happening is is there I, I guess with a, a peptide coacervate does it does it bind things like 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 lipids around the outside to form a me cell or a proto cell of, of any kind. So basically, there are different types of coercivates, not only the peptide based, they're lipid based and polysaccharides and others. So mostly those are membrane less because that was what was taught at the like uh, during the origins of life. The protocells must have been uh, membrane less that was taught earlier. But uh, uh, those membrane less compartments must have been membrane bound as the modern cell is. And there has been this mechanism, the liquid liquid phase separation, which actually leads to these membrane bound organelles. So maybe that answers your question. Yeah, it's very intriguing work. You know, I, I think we, you know, we kind of have been missing out on what is that key step. What is that early early step? And, and, and so things like coacervates and, and you've shown like they can be peptide, 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 organ and organic. There's a bunch of potential ways of having a lot of different reaction surfaces, a lot of area for things to happen inside of these regions. And so as you, you have me thinking a lot now about the early origins of life um, after your talk. Uh, so thank you for that. But I, I see we have two other questions I'd love to address. Um, I'll start with Arunava. Uh, yeah, I actually didn't have a question. I just wanted to add to what Shishi uh, mentioned about uh, membranes uh, emerging from potential coercivates. So yeah, there has been a pretty interesting study uh, which showed that uh, fatty acids encapsulated in uh, these kind of coercivates when uh, triggered due to certain kind of stimuli like pH or temperature, uh, can basically assemble into membranes around the person. Like when you like suddenly change the pH, those fatty acids will spontaneously arrange themselves uh, into membranes. So that's pretty interesting. That kind of shows how that this kind of theory might be possible. Like we'll try to attach a link or the DI link maybe in the chat. So yeah. 
Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, you, you all have me thinking that I, I want to pick up some paint and, and go paint a creation of life <laughs> of coacerbates happening. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Sanjoy has a question as well before we have the break here. Thank you, Shrishti. This is a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. I'm trying to link in my mind the coacervate theory of the origin of life with the knowledge that some of the, was the knowledge that the earliest enzymes have a metallic cofactor in them, like an iron sulfur cluster or magnesium. And, and so I'm trying to link up where do you see the coarservate theory having its metallic source such that, you know, to populate the, the activity, to populate the fact that all the ancient proteins have this, have this metallic cofactor that allow the enzymatic processes to, to unfold. Uh, sorry, I guess I didn't get your question there. <laughs> so, you... the, yeah, so the peptide peptide origin of life in the coarservate model. I mean, peptides is the, is the baseline for proteins. And so, and all of the early, pro, all of the early enzymes, which are combinations of proteins and RNA, have this metallic cofactor in them, which allow them to do the work. Um, like, and a common metallic cofactor is iron sulfur. And so I'm trying to link up where in the warm little pond scenario where there would not be any means of aggregating metallic ions. Um, how does that link up with the, with the uh, knowledge that some of the early proteins all have this, uh, these metals binded in them? Does that make sense? Yeah, a bit. <laughs> I guess uh, you're basically talking about the metabolism within the coercivates and how that's... <laughs> so let me try and rephrase this. What makes the enzymes able to do what they do uh, is because they have a, all the uh, old ones, it's because they have an iron sulfur cluster in them, right? So, at the origin of life, or at least at the origin of enzymes, was an environment that was rich in iron sulfur, presumably. Um, so I'm okay. trying to link this evidence with the kind of coarservate origin of life and the warm little pond thing that seems to me is not an environment that was rich in metals. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, so enzymes basically evolved quite later, I guess, means the basic metabolism was simple in the protocells. That was not that complex that much enzymes were involved within that. So um, I'm also not sure how this is much linked. I would like to explore about that more. But still, maybe there are certain kind of like peptide metal ions interactions, as you mentioned, and that kinds of interactions must have lead to these enzyme formation uh, and the origins of life related to it. That's good, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you.